Jeremiah, what does it mean to be gritty? Means it means to dig deep when you don't think you can dig any deeper. It's about to get crazy. It's about to go down. It's about to get crazy. It's gonna be loud. This is our house. We do what we wanna. We'll blow the roof off. Everybody's coming. It's yeah, about baby. to get crazy. It's about to go down. It's about to go down. You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty because life isn't fair and a little grit can make all the difference. <laughs> all right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. We are coming at you from the studio. I got Jeremiah Plyer here today from Wild Arrow Archery and Cody Jones, which kind of seems like two first names. Uh, no. Uh, no. Jones? No. Two last names. That's it's what like it is. Two great names. Yeah. I mean, there's two a lot of history between both. So. Yeah. We can kind of go. We can go with that. <laughs> so, you guys own or Jeremiah. You own Wild Air, Ar- Arrow Archery. How long have you had yeah. that? So, I've been a co-owner for probably about six years now. Okay. Um, there originally was started with a gentleman named Jeff Duke mm-hmm. and D Wild. And uh, there's actually some pretty cool history with Wild Arrow um, about kind of where we started. And we actually started the shop uh, in Layton, Utah, in 2003. And uh, moved it to Centerville, Utah in 2009, and we've been there ever since. So, okay. But, uh, yeah, I kind of came on board and uh, had the opportunity to be kind of an owner and, and uh, been doing that ever since, man. It's been a long time. So, How old are you? I'll be 34 this year. So it's just, old, just a baby. Dude. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, he's old. <laughs> <laughs> he's aged quite yeah. well. Yeah, it takes you years <laughs> off of you yeah. for sure. I wanted to have you guys in here. I moved, you know, people that are listening, I moved to Utah – I almost, it'll be like six or seven weeks ago. And, you know, I'm working uh, across the street. I got my house here across the street from the Mountain Ops Base Camp, whatever you want to call yeah. this, like the, the, the fortress. Everyone calls it like the HQ. You the know, HQ, HQ sounds yeah. cool. Yeah. So Headquarters. I, I uh, just got here and I got a new bow and, and I needed some help with it. So uh, I actually went out and I was just trying to sight it in because I thought it was ready to roll. And uh, went out there with Cody on this lot on this on this on this uh, dirt road. Yeah, our range. Yeah, <laughs> our, and then it's sneaky. Yeah, and it was nice. What is on the either side? Like cornfields? What are they? It's uh, it's actually just like a waterfowl management area out yeah, there. Yeah, it's just oh, wetlands. So it's it's just, wetlands. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So wetlands nice... and a jogging track on the other side. So. Yeah. Nice. So then we uh, dumped a tr- target out of the truck. A nice big block target. Oh yeah. And I didn't know uh, how good you were going to shoot, so I wanted to make sure we had plenty of plenty of, room. <laughs> plenty of target. Like, yes. I've heard things, but I was want to make sure. And then we stood down the road, and, and we let her fly, and it was a nice big target that's hard to miss completely. Right. Uh, and uh, I was a little frustrated because I wasn't hitting so well. And we had Toil Archery Challenge coming up in a couple of days, a few days, and I was just wanting to sight in this, uh, this sliding sight. So I have the Garmin. I've been using that, and mm-hmm. I love it. But when you're shooting beyond 100 yards, which you do at tack, uh, tack quite a, a lot, bit, yep. 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 I needed some kind of, I needed a sliding sight, and then I need it set up for states where the garment's not legal. Right. right. So got that black gold three pin sight. Really like it. So I'm I'm shooting, and I'm not shooting great, and uh, so I'm a little frustrated. So I go to Cody and I, uh, and and he's like, well, let me let me shoot it, and then he shoots it. And then uh, he doesn't shoot it too great either. Yeah. So 
That made me feel a lot better. <laughs> that, that's what <laughs> no, I, it's not you. Yeah, yeah. maybe the I'm, wa- I'm watching him shoot, and I'm like, "Ooh, isn't, what am I getting myself into?" Yeah. You know. And then I was like, <laughs> "I don't know if I can fix him. He's he's, yeah. he's a little broken." But then I shot it, and I was like, "Yeah, it's not just Brian." <laughs> so, um, and you get a new bow. You know, I've been traveling a lot, hadn't been right. around home, and I hadn't shot this bow. Hadn't shot my bow in like a month or so, and. So you, you know, I'm, I'm like, am I really this bad yeah. or what? And you know, a close range, I think forty and in, your your group's not tight, but it's right. you're killing an animal, reasonable, yeah. yeah. But you start stretching that out, and you start getting some big old, you know, spreads on those on those groups, and it it started to get real depressing, especially when Jordan Harbertson is there and he's you know shooting dimes it starts yeah. to really piss you off yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he, it sucks every time jordan tries to beat you at anything he's so competitive mm-hmm. he well just, he doesn't beat me at anything so yeah. it's hard for him yeah. But, yeah yeah so he was he was i think he was <laughs> he was just sitting there enjoying the moment like he wasn't saying was anything but you could bit? tell like he was like oh yeah i'm out shooting brian call yeah. it was great <laughs> so that's one thing i wanted to talk about was um you know guys will go and they'll get a bow and they'll they'll buy one. Let's say they'll go to Cabela's. They'll get a bow. They'll they'll you know set it up a little bit there, and then they'll go home and they'll start shooting arrows. And they think they're ready to go. And um, there's so much that goes into it. And and you know if you want to just Cody, if you want to walk some people through, because you took my bow and started messing around with it to get it to get it set up, right. and realized that you know there was a lot a lot out of tune right yeah i mean i just wanted to see where it was at so that's where i shot those few arrows just to see if okay if 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 i could see arrow flight was kind of basically i wanted to see if the bow was hitting behind the pin for me which isn't always in the middle but just see where that pin was in relationship to where that arrow was actually impacting and at that point i knew okay something's something's off because it wasn't hitting even close to where i thought at least it should have gone even if i was like "Ooh, that was a bad shot it should have been over here it, it wasn't so um at that point it's just for me it's easiest just to start over it's like i start looking at everything on your bow just see where it's lined up at and then uh go basically go back to square one looked at your cam timing looked at your cam lean looked at your center shot looked at those sort of things uh to start out at and then after that then you start looking at your arrow and we looked at your knock fit and we looked at all those sort of things but that was stuff we got into later after we took it to the shop and started, mm-hmm. you know, diving into it. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it was just, it was mostly just seeing where it was at. Right. I mean, you shot it. I watched your arrow fly. It didn't look like it was flying very well. Um, and then we watched you shoot and you were consistent. So I knew, okay, we just need to eliminate these factors and see, see where we go from there. What are the common things that, 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 are a problem that you see with guys that get a bow for the first time. Yeah, well, there's a lot. And, you know, <laughs> me and Cody always talk like when we sell a new bow to, especially a new bow hunter, there's a lot of education that we have to put into that guy. And, uh, but you know, number one, like any bow that we sell at the shop, it doesn't really matter from what brand they are never tuned from the factory. So like when we kind of go through, I mean, we want a customer to come to us because we want to set him off with a good base and a good platform to work off of. And guys that go elsewhere, get bows, you know, buy them used or from, you know, other sporting goods stores, that, that groundwork never gets set strong for those guys. And so they go out and they start shooting and get frustrated and go, man, archery sucks. This is hard. I can't hit the target. And they went to a place where they thought they were getting good service and trusted that. And so they think it's them and you go, well, Hey, look, there's could be all these other variables and all these other factors that could be affecting that. Mm-hmm. Let us help you work through those step by step. And hopefully when that guy kind of leaves our door, he goes, man, this was great. Like I got a new bow. I feel good. And we take our customers and say, okay, here's your new bow. We're going to set it up. We're going to fit it to you. We're going to tune it. And then we're going to show you how to shoot it. And that's where the one of the biggest mistakes I see with new shooters is we sell bows and every bow likes to be shot a little different. Like from when we teach guys how to shoot a Hoyt versus a Prime or a Matthews or Elite, It's kind of funny, but they all like a different grip pressure and they all like to be shot a little different. And so the biggest thing is, is taking those new guys and and educating them to say, Hey, look, like this is how your bow should be shot. We've got the tune. We got the groundwork set for you. 
And now you can start kind of building yourself from there. And, and that kind of boils down to the individual of like, well, how much time are you going to put behind your mm-hmm. bow? You get the, are you the type of guy that shoots one day a week or are you the type of guy that's going to shoot three to four days a week, you know? And so, but the biggest thing is just educating those customers to make sure that, Hey, like this is what we're doing for you at a pro shop level. And then from there, you can take it as high as you want to go with it. If you want to get to the level where you shoot, great. But it's going to take some time for you to put it behind the string. So, Yeah. The problem is guys don't know what they don't know. Right. So I've shot my bow quite a bit, you know, for years and years and years. And then I learned a lot over the last couple of years shooting with Aaron Snyder at the range and picking up some things and talking to Phil Mendoza at No Limits Archery yeah, in, stud, yeah. in yep. Colorado, in Denver. So I've learned a lot. And so, and I've tried all sorts of releases and release aids and gone to different kind of shooting training lessons and camps and stuff. And so I feel like shooting, I I have a, a, a good understanding of shooting and I execute, execute a fairly good shot. Right. Right. So when I sit down and I'm struggling to hit the target and I pick up another bow and it's hitting dead on, then it's easy for me to go, okay, it's not me. There's a, there's something wrong with this bow. Right. Um, but I felt a little bit like a, a new bow owner when I showed up here and I had a brand new bow, brand new arrows and a brand new release I'd never used before. So all three together at the same time just made me think that, that I was just not used to the release, that I wasn't used to the bow, that I wasn't executing. I, I, I wasn't sure. It felt kind of good, but then you, you send that arrow down range and it's like, whoom, and it's like six, eight inches off and you're like, and then the next one's totally off in another spot. And yeah. I start, you start to have some, you know, you start to, to wonder. Well, confidence, right? Like yeah. confidence is king with behind your bow. Like if you don't pull your bow out of the case and go, man, this last time I shot it, that, you know, the arrow hit behind the pin, I was aiming it well, everything felt perfect. Yeah. When you don't have confidence, then you start going in your mind, you're going, okay, what, what is it? The variable, is it my bow? Is it my arrows? Is it my release? You know, you start questioning all those things, and then once you lose that confidence in a in a setup, it's hard to get that back. And well, when you get the bow, like for me, uh, you messed around with it for a couple of days, had me come back down to the shop. I went down there. You guys had you know done done your magic to it, adjusted things, got the timing right, and adjusted the the rest, like everything, yeah. right? Till it was shooting bullet holes through paper. Right. So for people that are listening, like describe that, that process. Well, uh, to get a bow to shoot through paper, it's, that's that magical standard that I think everybody wants when they get their bow. Like, well, does it shoot a bullet hole? Which, which is, and before you go there, there's a lot of guys listening that don't even know what, what you're talking about. Right. So it's basically how the arrows, basically your bow is a catapult and how it's, how it's delivering an arrow shaft through flight, right? Um, We call it arrow delivery. Arrow delivery. Basically you hang, we're hanging a sheet of paper and we're, we're literally firing an arrow through it with a, with a safe target behind there. And we're really seeing how that bow and arrow likes to deliver together. And it could be a combination of, well, if my bow's not tuned and it's not repeating a good shot, well, then I can't blame the arrow. But if my bow is somewhat tuned and I got everything set, but the arrows are still tearing and you'll, you'll hear, you know, paper tuning with well, if that arrow kicks left, right, up or down, well, there's usually a bow adjustment you can be, that can be made to correct for that arrow flight and make that arrow fly as straight as possible. But so you can look at the paper and the shot and, and after it passes through the paper, the arrow passes through the paper. Correct. If it looks just like a little bullet hole, right. Then it's flying. It's perfect. Right. But if it's, ripped big old hole in the paper then you know yeah. it's going through the paper crooked it's not going through straight and right and, and well, it's off and and you know i tell guys like a, a paper tune is a great starting point to see if your bow and arrow combo likes to work together but there's been a lot of bows that were we can look at it and go man this bow just does not look right there's something wrong with it but it still shoots a good clean paper tune and that's some of those things where i tell guys like look Sometimes a good bullet hole doesn't mean everything. That's just a starting point to really see how your bow is going to shoot and group down range. Because, you know, I have guys come in all the time that try to paper tune their bow at home. They'll get online. They'll read mm-hmm. some things and go, hey, I'm going to go home and tune my own bow. I just had one of these last week. And he comes in and his center shot's moved way over. 
almost to the point where his veins are clipping his cables and he's still shooting a way knock left. And he's like, dude, I can't figure it out. I've done everything online that it told me to do, Mm -hmm. but I'm not getting the results I want to see. And so I take his bow, I adjust the rest back out, set it where it should be and how to correct his grip pressure. He was torquing the bow so bad with his front hand that that was causing an issue. So anyway, paper tuning is a great starting point, but I tell guys like if you're paper tuning at home, uh, what I like to do, and I recommend this for all my customers is, you know, bring it down to the shop. Let me and Cody tune it and make sure that that bow and arrow work perfectly together. And and we know we've tuned enough bows in our day that we know if that combination is going to work well or not. But then go home and get your own paper tuner and then learn how to shoot your bow through paper. Don't adjust anything. Don't adjust the rest. Don't adjust, you know, arrow spine. Learn how to shoot that bow to where me and Cody have set it because we know if that setup wasn't going to work before it left our shop, we would have told the guy, hey, look, your bow is great. It's tuned, but your arrows are too weak or too stiff. And so, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, that paper tuning, when guys get at home and they start trying to do that, like it's really important to know that was that bow set up initially right the first time and did that arrow combination work before you kind of go on to the right. next step? Because how many guys go into Cabela's or Sportsman's or something and then they, they buy a dozen arrows? They have no idea what right. what stiffness of arrow to buy. So no. many guys think that stiffness is the weight of the they arrow do. still. Yeah, most guys come yeah. in there like, well, that's a 300-grain arrow, right? Or, or a 400-grain mm-hmm. arrow, yeah. and then we have to educate them. And it's kind of disheartening that the guys at those other sporting goods stores didn't explain those sort of things. But yeah, they think that it's the, the, the weight. Of they just the don't know. Yeah. They just right. don't know. They just have no, no idea, idea what the spine is. Nope. 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 So, uh, w- so they end up buying just some arrows. Right. Right. And they're screwed from the get go because th- those arrows are either too stiff or too weak or cut way too long. We see that oh, yeah. all the time. So, yep. 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 Yeah. We and see so that. that takes, uh, someone with some actual knowledge that knows what they're doing, right? Uh, to you know, to 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 match those arrows up with the bow. But even after that, it comes there. There, there needs to be that process of, of verifying that that arrow actually flies out of that bow that they that they match, right? You know, on mine, there were uh, once we got it to that point where it, Every now and then, I'd get some that flew well through paper, and then I'd have some that tore through paper. And so the, this next step, which I've run into in the past as well, um, was knock tuning the arrows. Right. So describe that, Jeremiah. Like, what is that process? So when a guy gets a say twelve arrows, every arrow has a different spine point in that arrow shaft. And when you get like a lot of these factory fletched arrows, that you don't know where that spine is going to be. And so when you fire that arrow, your bow, every arrow can actually react differently. And so knock tuning is basically putting your arrow on the string and firing it. And we like to use paper tuning as this, especially bare shafts. Like me and Cody do a lot of bare shaft tuning this way. But if you knock that arrow on your string, and sometimes that arrow will kick to the left, right? Or to the right or up or down. Well, you'll see guys make bow adjustments. Well, maybe it wasn't the bow. It was just that arrow. So when you knock that arrow the next time, if you rotate that arrow, maybe to the next fletching is now facing up and fire it. If it changed your paper tune, that's called knock tuning. You're basically trying to align the spine of the shaft consistently where the bow likes to fire it. And if you can take all of your arrows and align them to the exact same position, your consistency in your grouping is going to tighten down quite a bit. And, uh, so that's kind of when we get into that knock, knock tuning, but that's what we would kind of, me and Cody would kind of consider some next level tuning because when you're starting to get into that knock tuning, especially bare shaft or like we did with your arrows rotating it, the shooter has to be consistent enough to repeat the same shot over and over and over. And if a guy goes out there and tries to knock tune his arrows, but he can't repeat the same shot, mm-hmm. how can you identify if it's an arrow issue or a shooter issue, you know? So, but yeah, that's the processes that we go through a lot with our, with our own personal equipment. Uh, we try to definitely do that with our customers once they get to that level of yeah. shooting. Yeah, so. we sat there and I basically knock tuned every arrow I had before I yeah. went to tack. Yeah. And 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 you know all that consists of is just that little shift. You right. just twist the knock, right? So that the the arrow is sitting on the the arrow the bow just a slight turn. Yeah, from the last shot until you find where that weak spot is. Right. Yeah. You'll see a lot of guys talk about using a, like a mechanical shooting device, like a hooter shooter. I hear guys mm-hmm. use that all the time. We used to have one of those. I'm not, I'm honestly not a big fan of that. It, it, to me, it just takes way too much time to use the hooter shooter. And, 
you know, if you get everything set and perfect, when you shoot your bow out of that mechanical shooting device with arrows that are noctuned, you can literally get them to hit the same exact hole consistently. But what I found works best for me is actually uh, paper tuning every single one of my arrows. Uh, I feel like I'm consistent enough now with my form technique, grip pressure, that kind of thing, where mm -hmm. I can take 12 arrows and get every one of them to repeat the exact same shot through paper consistently. And it's way faster than me going and using a mechanical shooting device mm -hmm. to do that. But Well, the first time that I ran into that was years ago. I drew a tag for Arizona and, mm -hmm. and as, and so I was been practicing a lot. And then a few, like a week or so before I left, I, I put my broadheads on and I was just going to kind of sight in with my broadheads. And, um, once I put the broadheads on, I was just getting flight everywhere, right? Like just everywhere. And I felt pretty good about my shot and everything when I had the field tips on. But once I put the broadheads on, my arrows were just not consistent at all. Right. And I couldn't figure it out uh, sometimes. And so I, I just, in total frustration, it was a three fletch arrow. And I took it into Corey Miller at triple X archery in in uh, Oregon area, Washington went in there and I'm like, Corey, dude, and he he shot my bow into the target with the broadhead and and uh didn't hit the bullseye. He went down and got it. He came back. He twisted the arrow a little bit. Bullseye. Right. Then he grabbed the next one. And after like 20 minutes, all of them were hitting the bullseye. Yeah. Just because he twisted the knock. I was like, what the hell? And I had gone <laughs> to like four different shops. Yeah. No, like, I can't explain it. I don't know. You're just going to have to get to And I would get different broadheads in, in Oregon. It's illegal to use mechanical, right. so you have, you have to have to a fixed, fixed blade. blade. Yep. Right. As soon as I put that giant fixed blade on the front and the wind, and it just, it just, it just made every imperfection just magnify, magnify for sure. Yep. Well, so he knocked to him, and then I was like, yeah. "Wow, that you was know, my first lesson." Yeah, you know, and, and here's what I used to do when I was younger, and before I knew how to do any of this stuff, like, and I tell this to my customers today is like. When you buy, say you go buy a dozen arrows from the factory. They're factory fletched, so you can't knock tune them. It's really hard to do that. Take a silver Sharpie and number all your arrows, as many of you have. If you have 12 arrows, great. Number them 1 through 12. And then what you want to do, go take a, that broadhead, take your fixed blade broadhead, and go shoot that, that one broadhead on all 12 of your arrow shafts. Make sure it's balanced. Make sure everything looks good. And then you want to find maybe the top four or five arrows that always fly and shoot the best, the most consistent with that broadhead. Because that arrow, those four or five arrows, are the ones that are spine aligned properly to your bow. You can still use your other arrows for practice. Use it with a field tip and you'll still shoot great. But, you know, for a guy that, that can't go to a good pro shop that knows how to knock tune arrows and do that, or they just don't have the time, it's like, hey, number your arrows, put that broadhead on, and then shoot that one broadhead on all 12 shafts until you find... The, the ones you feel the most confident in that hit, you know, the arrow still hits behind the pin. And those are going to be your hunting arrows. Go hunt and use those right. and save the other ones for practice. So, Well, that was one thing, like, I hadn't knocked tuned in a long time. I, I, Corey Miller, we did a few tests. We did some podcasts on this years ago from Triple X, and he had one of those spined machines yep. where, you know, you put the arrow in and then and then you twist it, and it, it, it lets you, it has a little pin. Indicator, yeah, we have one of those indicator. in the shop, too. Yeah. yeah. And then as you throw, and then it's like, boom, it yeah. just like. You'll have just, a high and a low spot for sure. Right. And so uh, this little machine basically tells you where the weakest spot on that spine is. Right. Uh, on the shaft. And so he was, he was walking through that and we were taking dozens and dozens of arrows from all the different brand manufacturers and we were putting it, putting them in there and twisting them and, and then finding out Marking that. Marking them. Yep. Yeah. And what we found, what he found over, over the years was that. It, I think it was, I don't remember victory. Yeah. Like, like where theirs were, uh, pretty much there was very little variance in the shaft right? from shaft to shaft. Like there wasn't really a weak spot compared to the other brand manufacturers and the same with gold tip. I mean, not gold tip, uh, black Eagle. Right. So black Eagle, we throw these dozens of arrows of these and we were using some rampage and I don't remember what the other. Uh, I, I, I think it was the carnivore or the zombie slayers. I'm not sure, but you put those in and again, they stayed. And then we, we, I learned, you know, how they build arrows and how they'll, you know, cut, you know, how they'll measure them with a laser right. at the factory. 
and see that what their tolerance is, but then they measure like just the center piece of the shaft, but not the edges, the ends, yep. not the ends. And well, so we for years would cut off each end of our shafts and try to get the straightest and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So we went through all of that kind of stuff and sort of pieced it. And what I found was I didn't have to knock tune a lot of my black Eagle arrows, but now I have the, the Valkyrie system right. with the, the micro diameter X impact black Eagle right. shaft. And with that 200 grain, with the heavy tip and that micro shaft, I'm, I've found that I, I have to knock tune. Right. And it really matters. So for years, what guys would do to hide that is they just go to a really stiff arrow. Like you go, hey, if I went to a 300 spine arrow. So what you're talking about, the difference is, is between what we call static spine and dynamic spine. Mm -hmm. So static spine, if you put it in that arrow spinner and you put weight on it and you twist that arrow and you can see the high low side of the spine, right? And, and obviously, the more consistent they are, that's better. But when you start running that Valkyrie system now with all that weight up front and your your string just dumps hard into that, that arrow, well, that arrow still needs to flex and bend. And so that's where I tell a lot of guys like static spine aligning your arrows by twisting them and marking them is a great starting point. But dynamic spine aligning your shaft to how your bow fires that arrow is a, more important to us. And so that's where, again, going from... You know, because we have that that same machine you're talking yeah. about, we put in and dial in. It, it's a great starting point to to work off of for sure. But again, how my bow delivers that arrow is more important to me. And and you know, we talk about this all the time at the shop when we're you know we're there late at night tuning bows and mm -hmm. tinkering around. Yep. It's like, well, maybe one bow because of how that cam fires, maybe it has a certain cam lean to it, or the riser flexes a certain way. Maybe it likes the stiff side of the shaft to be to the right or to the left or right. to the top or bottom, right? Well, that's based off each individual bow of how it's firing that arrow. So having your arrow spine aligned is great to keep them consistent. But how that arrow still gets delivered out of your bow it's different. is different. Yeah. yeah, it's still different. Yep. So. Yeah. So we ended up marking, you know, on my arrow, we, we just twist it, twist it, twist it till I shot through paper right, perfectly right. with each shaft. and. Right. It's pretty bad. Like if I, so then we marked it like, uh, so I knew it's a four fletch, right. just put a little line on the fletch. So I knew that, 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 that's where the arrow needed to face up when I put it on the, on the string. Right. right. Well, <clears throat> so the thing is, is if I didn't do that, which I haven't had that habit in a long time with the three fletch, I always put the cock vein up, right. right you know, right. get lazy, you kinda, just do it fast. Now yeah. I've just been, Hey, you just load the arrow anywhere you, you want. You got four fletches, whichever way I put on. Yeah, it's good. And because I haven't really had any trouble with, the, with, uh, this knock tuning thing, you know, I was, uh, but I, I was shooting a pretty lightweight arrow last year and, um, and, uh, I got pretty good flight, like consistent. R r I was very accurate, but, right. but, it, uh, the arrows are just blowing the wind like, yeah. big time. And then I didn't get the penetration I wanted and a lot of things I didn't want. So as I've switched over to this new system, you know, I love it, but I, I noticed like if I put that arrow on without the spine being aligned where it needs to go on the, on that each time dude, my arrow's like way off. Like <laughs> it's quite the disappointing arrow flight. Yeah. Like it looks like a, it's like wobbling down the, well, and it's so crazy. Range. You go shoot it like 50, 60 yards and you get this nice little group going. All of a sudden you're like, how did that arrow get clear the heck over there? It's way low left. You're yeah. like, the shot felt good. The pin was on the target and it broke. And so, you know, that's when you're like, you go back, you shoot that arrow the next time you knock it on your string, you rotate it just a quarter turn. And that's one of the great things about that four fletch. Like we've, we've ran four fletches for a lot of years because it does give you really four positions to tune that shaft versus a three fletch. You're, you're a little bit more yeah. limited, but, and then, you know, you go back at 60 yards, you rotate that arrow and you shoot and it goes right back in the group. You're like, Oh, light bulb goes off. You're like, Oh, okay. That's but if you don't know that, you just right. think you, you just always think you made suck. a bad shot. Yeah. Like yeah. you just think, <laughs> yeah, man, sometimes I'm on and I always get these like, one offs that right. go out way off and right. it's like no it's not you're not your bow is your your arrow not your arrows are not all tuned for, for right. your bow. well yeah. and that goes back to like you know what i was telling earlier about like numbering your arrows right hey take a notepad put it down on your target and every time you go down to pull arrows mark a, what arrow hit the middle and what didn't and and it start trying to eliminate some as many variables as you can and say man arrow number six was always low left and i feel like i'm making shots well 
maybe that's just a bad arrow, you know, get that one out because you don't want to lose confidence in your own self and shooting thinking, Oh man, every now and then I just, I throw that arrow low left. Well, right. it could be the arrow, not, not necessarily the get shooter. rid of it. Get rid of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Make just eliminate sp- variables yep. as many of you, those as you can. Yeah. And then you just take that arrow and you shoot frogs with it. Yeah. 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 Great frog. <laughs> I tell guys that grouse arrows, you know, cause the yep. grouse hunt here in Utah, you can yep. hunt grouse. And so hunt you grouse. always got to have that one arrow in your quiver. That's the perfect one for that. So, yeah. So what's another what's what's another common mistake that guys make when they're getting set up? Draw length. Yeah. I, I, draw length is probably the biggest one that that we battle when guys come in and they just get it set up. And so so when I say draw length, I mean draw length to actually where that string position is on their face, but also the the distance of the release length. Is, yeah, is a big is huge. a big key. Um, they say, "Oh well, I think my draw length's wrong." Well, sometimes it's not necessarily the actual draw length of the bow as to where that relates to their face, but it's mm-hmm. actually their release length or the loop length or draw length in general, including okay. both of those things. I think that's the biggest thing that we see is is that placement, or we get a lot of maybe the older guys that come in that have never been really taught. They've just been self-taught the whole time and they have, you know, these old releases with the old Cobras is is one of the examples where it's like, you know, it's like a six inch, you know, bar length on their release. And so then they're putting their thumb behind their, you know, behind their head and they're anchoring way back. I'd say draw length is probably Hmm. fit fit and draw length and and hand position to your anchor. I feel like that's something, you know, I would just take for granted. People would figure out. It, uh, you know, I, we tell guys at the shop all the time when they come in and say, look, we could, we can sell you the best equipment we have here, the top of the line, everything. Right. But if we don't fit that bow to you the right way, it's not going to do you any good. I could sell you the brand new white carbon and all this fancy stuff, but you know, that, uh, yeah, it, it's bad. And you know, we, we kind of, we talk about this all the time at the shop going, there's so many guys that learn shooting from generations, right? Like, well, my dad taught me how to shoot. Yeah, well, well, right. well, who taught your dad? Well, his dad did. And it's like, okay, it's, it's kind of this generational thing, but I look at it and go, man, so many of these guys come in that I'm like, we could make you so much better of an archer if you just let us work with you. Let us change yeah. some of these. Right. It's it's hard to break guys' habits. So if they've been shooting a certain way for, you know, their whole life, yeah, it's hard absolutely. to break that habit and, and, you know, change your draw length. They're like, that don't feel right. And I go, I know it doesn't feel right, but it's going to be better. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Two steps backwards to go 10 steps forwards yeah. kind of a thing. I feel bad for people that, that are... You know, the, I go I go to the range and I watch them shoot, and they're they're ginching on the shot and slamming yeah. triggers, and they're all over the place. Right and beyond thirty yards, they're just screwed. Yep. Like I mean, it, target panic is an epidemic. It is. It's bad. We fight it nonstop with our customers. It's terrible. But guys don't want to invest in a, in, in good releases. It's like. You know, we sell a lot of those $80 index releases, which are some really good ones on the market, as long as you shoot them the right way. If you know yeah. how to shoot them, they work great. But, you know, we, we tell our customers all the time, if they would invest in like a good hinge style or a pull tension style release aid, man, what you can do for your shoot. It's like almost kind of like having a coach working with you if you learn how to shoot that the right yeah. way, you know. So I noticed you started shooting a lot more hinges and some pull tension releases the past couple of years. So Yeah, and it's interesting. You were talking earlier about bows. And how they're different from bow to bow Mm -hmm. and how they like to have pressure and things like that. And I find that on my, um, carbon defiant, uh, I really like the hinge a lot and it feels really good. You know, I come to full draw, just, just perfect. And I pull through and I shoot it really well. I put that same hinge on the RX one and it's harder to shoot. Like I have a hard time shooting that and then i've got dudley's um knock to it yeah the the thumb button okay. yep. trigger i shoot that rx1 with that quite well but uh the hinge is a little harder and right. I, i'm finding like how much pressure i put on the bow like ten, back tension mm-hmm. like i'm ripping the wheels off with that with that uh defiant i don't do that with the rx1 i just barely pull like i Otherwise, I'd pull off target. Right. So it's taken a little time. Like, I like both bows. They're just different. They shoot different. And yeah. I have to shoot them differently. Well, there's yeah. there's just within that, there's a lot of little variables that we take into account. Like, uh, one, the grip position on a Defiant versus an RX-1. RX-1, they lowered the grip position down. Uh, yeah. Your hold weight. 
how, you know, you know, if you're going to an 85% let off cam versus a 75% let off cam. And then the other big thing that we see a lot, cause you know, kind of a perk of working in a bow shop, me and Cody get to play and tinker with a lot of bows is that we, when you see this all the time, guys will come in and go, well, I'm a 29 inch draw. So I'm going to set my cam and I'm going to set this bow to 29. Well, every bow can be different. It, it, you know, that draw length changes by an eighth of an inch mm-hmm. and it can make a big effect. So, you know, a lot of times what me and Cody do with our bows, when we find a bow that we're like, man, we just click with this thing, kind of like you're defiant. You're like, man, it aims well. It hits the middle. My hinge release feels great. Take everything you can on that bow and measure it. Measure the true draw length on the bow. And that's where a lot of those bow companies, they'll say, okay, it's 29. But we've seen in certain cases, bow manufacturers, bows run half inch long. You set the bow to 29, it pulls 29 and a half. And so there's a lot of those little variables that guys don't take into account when they're going, well, why did I shoot my Defiant? Great with this release, but as soon as I get this bow, it doesn't feel the same. Well, there's a lot of those little changes and variables that you got to take into account and figure out, well, maybe that's why. Or So, yeah, this, we fight that all the time. Like I was just shooting my Carbon Spider this last weekend. It's my backup bow. I take it on all my hunts, and it sits in my truck. If I'm out hunting, I slip and fall and come crashing down and bend a cam on a rock, which we see happen all the time. I go back to my truck. I grab my backup bow, and I go back out in the mountain hunting. So. And it's very interesting to me, from, even from my RX-1 to my Carbon Spider, yeah, they they both fill and shoot just a little bit different there. So, Yeah, I'm finding that too. Like, And I am not some I, – once I find something that really works and that I like, it's I don't like yeah. to switch. It's hard to yeah. change. You and get that magical recipe and you're like, yeah, it's so, yep. it shoots so good. I'm, yeah. I'm experiencing that right yeah. now. And, <laughs> you know, but then with what I do, it's, it's, it's pretty – it's just part of the job. You right. know, I need to try and set up the new new gear and and start using that. And and uh, it's it 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 takes quite a while to to get it all all the kinks ironed out and to get everything right perfect. And it's uh, it's an evolution. Uh, every year, I learn yeah. more and more about archery, and I get. I get more and more dialed. But. See, that used to be very difficult for me. Um, like, cause when I, when I was younger, I had just one bow and I had to shoot the same bow for like five or six years, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I got so dialed in and in tune with that bow. And then when I started working in archery shops and I'd get these new bows, it was, it was so hard for me to try to go and set up a new bow and learn how to shoot and get comfortable. But over the years, as you know, we've done it so many times, like that transition for us has gotten a lot smoother, a lot easier. Like, yeah, we might not go out and shoot the, the the perfect groups with our new bow, but we can get dialed in re- pretty quickly, and we can switch bow brands. Like I can take my prime and set it up and go. You know, I hunt a turkey with mine. I set my bow up in a day. Got it shooting dialed in. I was shooting groups out to seventy yards with it pretty fast. You go. I go back ten years ago when I first started getting in archery. There's no way I could have done that. That would have mm-hmm. taken me three months of solid right. work to get that bow shooting where I wanted to go. Yeah. I feel like I'm still in the three months yeah. of solid work <laughs> section yeah. Yeah. With, it, with your new bow. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of difference there. I mean, you're shooting a carbon defiant 34 mm-hmm. is what your, your black one is. Yep. Um, Jeremiah mentioned the let off is definitely different on those yeah. two bows. Your actual lever arm and where you're pulling due to grip relation ship is, is different. Yeah. The grip feels way different. Yeah. Though. It's different due to the, the fact that it's lower. Also, um, just, Axle to axle, actual string angle yep. from that totally bow to different. your face is totally different. So maybe like Jeremiah said, you shot this bow at this draw length, but this bow's matched at this draw length. But if you actually drew it back versus each other, that, there could be some variables no, the, there that, that the we RX one is shorter really? than my Defiant. Yeah, as far as draw length goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot I of those, tried the yeah. the normal length, and I was like, dude, this is too long. Right. Like, whoa. Right. Even though they're the same, so it's a half inch shorter than my Defiant. Yeah, just that in itself, right there. There's a lot of differences, mm-hmm. so it's like it's like learning a new, a yeah, new retraining bow yourself retraining. now to shoot that bow for sure. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. There's some changes there. I know in my experience, um, you know, I'm learning all the time by switching to a hinge. Yeah, it completely changed the way I shoot a bow and how I see a bow. Right. At the same time, you know, I. I have struggled hunting with a hinge. Really? And and we've talked yeah. about this a little bit. Like yeah. in that moment when I've got, you know, there are times where I'm totally calm, like ice in the veins. Right. And my hands aren't shaking, you know, and I just relax into that hinge and just pull Execute through. Execute it. Yep. Yeah. But there are times where my 
fingers were like an iron claw <laughs> and I could not just, grip just it. could yeah. not. My heart was raging. Yeah. I could not get my hand yeah. to relax. I couldn't get it to relax. And I don't shoot the hinge. I've heard some people say they, they rip it o- over right. to shoot it. Um, I've never tried that. Never practiced that. It's not like how I, you know, I talked to John Dudley about this for a while and yeah. he's like, you know, that's not how he does it. You know, a lot of guys, you know, it's part of that whole process is relaxing through that shot. It's very interesting to me. I've been doing this a long time and, and I would, t- I talk to a lot of what I consider professional archers mm-hmm. and of how many of them do something just a little different, you know, yeah, it's every like, one of them. yeah. And so, you know, through the years when we've learned, it's like, well, what works best for you and your system? But you know, w- with a hinge, I'll never forget the first time I shot one. And most guys that come into the shop kind of have the same reaction. It's so funny that they'll hand them a release and, and their anticipation of the shot is just so bad that they'll draw that back and shoot it and they're like, nope, I don't want it and put it on the counter. And I did the same thing my first time. And now I fast forward years later, I hunt with mine. I hunt with my religion. Uh, and, and I'll admit it, I get bad buck fever. When you get a big buck in front of me, my heart starts going and you know, with those other releases, it takes a lot of mental control for me to make good, clean shots. But with my hinge release, for whatever reason, I just make the best shots with those. I aim the best. And, and you know, I've been hunting with mine for three years now. I've had several kills with it, and it's worked great. And I know Cody, you know, he, he hunts with a hinge. He's even hunted with a pull tension release before and killed yeah, some I, good, I have to. If I don't, I, I got the panic pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, to, I, have to, I have to limit myself on releases and what i shoot and for me shooting a hinge or shooting a pole tension style release like deadly silverback the carter evolution uh we had some hamsky breakthroughs those kind of releases that build off of just both tension right um it, it for me it forced me to calm down in that situation mm-hmm. where you're like man i could just get all amped up and all excited and all those sort of things when you see that animal standing there but for me it, it forced me it's like okay like you have to calm down to make this good shot if you want to harvest that animal cleanly and make a good shot it forces me to calm down. So, so okay, so that's an interesting idea because I thought, well, this will force me to calm down. Yeah, right. it didn't force me to calm <laughs> down. <laughs> it made it worse. You just rage through it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, like in that moment, I've never had any trouble with a with any kind of. I don't I, like you were saying a minute ago. There's a bit of uh, you. You need it to keep yourself from just slump punching the trigger. Right. 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 You know, I've never had target panic that at least at any kind of like involuntary level, like, uh, you know, I, I will say like in, there are years where I would match that pin up and kind of time the it. The timer. The, we call it the drive-by. It. We call it a drive-by. Right. By. Yep. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, like I'm picking a spot. I'm calm. I'm like, hold, hold, hold. Okay. Here we go. And I, and I execute like, and I don't do a lot of like freaking out or shot input right. into the shot. When I intentionally fire a shot. So that's what, that's what we would call a controlled shooter. And yeah. there's actually some really good shooters like Tim Gillingham. He is a yeah. controlled shooter. He'll admit it. They, you know, they call him the hammer for a reason. Yep. And, uh, as long as you can aim properly, it doesn't, in my opinion, I don't care if you, if you hammer on that trigger or if you pull through it, as long as your ability to aim and hold that pin right where you want that arrow to go, it's fine. Where most guys usually struggle, though, and they create that target panic is when that pin float, starts to float movement, and they we call it the drive-by, they try to time that pin to hit the middle of that target. Mm-hmm. And that's when you start seeing the issues. And So, yeah. yeah, as long as your ability to aim and hold in those situations, even if you have to control it and send it when you're ready, that's mm-hmm. fine as long as your aiming ability is, is there. Yeah, it's 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 a in my experience, it's kind of like a it's a fight or flight thing, right? Your your brain sees the pin bouncing around, it knows there's an explosion of some sort that's going to happen when your bow goes off, right? It's a bang, it's a it's an explosion, yep. um, and so your your mind wants to be efficient, right? As soon as that pin gets close to the dot, it's like let's send it, let's get this done with. I don't want to be surprised by what's about to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So, I think that's where most archers struggle is just letting themselves mentally allow that pin to float. It, it's, yeah, it's the floating well, thing, and that's that for sure. Like out. the hinge has taught me that. Mm-hmm. You know, hunt, shooting with a hinge all the time, I've come to accept the float. Like, it, right. it that's doesn't huge. That's not a thing. Like, I just like I I know that if I'm floating near, right, I'm good. Yeah. Do you feel like your float's gotten smaller with that though? Like for me, when I shoot, when I shoot like my old index releases, like it took me a long time to learn how to aim just really strong on target. And when I went to my hinge, like. 
that natural pin float movement just got smaller and steadier because I learned how to sit up more with my back, more back tension. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's where I think where we recommend those releases to our customers all the time. It's like, hey, if we can get your float, your pin float to, from the size of a grapefruit down to the size of a ping pong ball, you're still going to float. But that smaller movement on target, there's something that happens where you, you don't have that flight or flight like Cody talks about. You're more calm and relaxed because the yeah. pin is now more steady. Definitely. On the you see less float. Definitely so you that float panic. is like, yeah. it's just stuck there. It's there, but not as big for what, sure. What I find, especially with my my new setup, is uh, that the longer I'm at full draw, the the wider the float gets. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, I got to come through that shot pretty quickly. Right. Th- if I'm sitting there for too long, then I just – make physiology kicks mm-hmm. in. I can just only hold so steady. And then it's like a oh, – you got to concentrate. You really got to push hard yep. to, to, to try to stick that thing where it's at. Right. And, yeah, the accuracy goes way down. I think it's let off. Honestly, a lot of that stuff is let off. Like we shoot, we shoot higher poundage bows and it's not really to shoot higher poundage so I can shoot a bigger, heavier arrow faster and heavier and harder. It's just mostly the let off, uh, more holding weight keeps me in a tighter steadier. position at full mm-hmm. draw and steadier. Yeah. I mean, there's some sacrifices to that if that bull walks out and he's standing there behind a tree for three minutes and I have to be at full draw, it kind of sucks at that point. But for making a good shot, um, you know, those lower let off bows, if you hold it for too long, yeah, you start to kind of get lazier and lazier as that shot progresses before you fire that arrow. Yeah. So I'm the think- same way. I like, I like a little bit higher hold weight on my bow. Yep. And it, as you shoot and get stronger, you'll notice that I want to keep kind of bumping that hold weight up a little bit. And, you know, a yep. lot of these newer cams, all these manufacturers come out with a lot higher let off. And when you start adjusting, like a post to change your let off, it affects draw length. It kind of creates this chain reaction. And so one way that we've kind of done it, you know, is just like Cody said, we shoot a little bit heavier draw weight to increase our hold weight a little bit higher. And once you kind of find that, that sweet spot, man, I seem to aim my bow. If I go too high, like I used to, you know, shoot a spiral cam, a Hoyt target bow with spiral cams on it at 60 pounds. I couldn't hold it. I could not hold and aim that bow. But as soon as I back that bow down to about 55 pounds, Man, that was like, there was a sweet spot there where it locked me in. I could aim, but the cam wasn't overly bearing and over aggressive. But as you shoot and progress and prep more time behind your bow, and I built that shooting muscle up, like I can start to bump that poundage and that holding weight. And the stronger I got, the better I was aiming. And so it kind of correlates and goes back and forth with each other there. You kind of, you kind of start doing this leapfrog right. thing. Right. Yeah. You know? Hinges, hinges or any of those style releases open up a whole world of difference for guys. Cause they'll come in there like, yeah, I use back tension with their index. Like, yeah, I use back tension. I shoot back tension all the time. But then when you see them break the shot, there's, there's no expansion. Yep. There's no, there's no movement. And then you actually hand them, I'll hand them a tension release that's off their poundage. Right. And so there's no hinge to roll. There's no nothing there. So it's just like, okay, you're aiming. Okay. Now just pull till the bow breaks and th- they can't get it to go off because they're not pulling right. the same way. So there's a lot of variables that, that play into <laughs> release <laughs> aids like you've noticed in between both. Yeah, I'm struggling. Like, you know, I killed uh, my mountain goat with the hinge and I killed an elk with the hinge and I killed this bear in that recent film mm-hmm. with the hinge. Um, and there are times where I just feel like, like I shoot better with the hinge, no doubt, if I'm shooting all the time with the hinge and it's just like a, and, and I'm just like, so like automatic. With right. It. But then there's, you know, it's like shooting a basketball, the free throws or something. It's like you take a week or two weeks off and you get back on the line and it's like, lose that muscle memory. Numbers. It's yeah. like, things aren't quite right. Yep. Well, I get away with murder when I have a thumb button versus yeah. when I have a hinge. <laughs> and that's fine. Honestly, there was days where I was like, okay, I'm going to mentally fight my target panic because it's all in my head. It's mm-hmm. nothing to do. It's just it's just me and the pin and the whole experience of letting it float and stuff. And there's days where I've gone back and that pin is just holding so good and I can basically command shoot it. I just slowly squeeze through that trigger. I don't smash it, but I send it basically. Mm-hmm. And I've shot phenomenal groups that way. The problem is I can't do it consistently. Yeah. Because there's, there, I have good days and I have bad days. The hinges, I'm a lot more consistent overall yeah. with my hinge. So, yeah. see, when I get really, when I get really nervous, and the and and so you're shaking, right? Because your 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 adrenaline's flowing and all that. It's it gets pretty hard to hold that pin steady. You're breathing heavy, you know, and I can kind of 
hold for a sec and start to pull through a little bit, but with my hand is as tight as it yeah. is, like you know, it, it's only on certain animals and in certain situations because not everyone's the same. It's right. like I'm oddly calm sometimes, yeah. and then yep. sometimes I'm like maybe it caught me off guard or whatever. Yeah, factors the, leading up to yeah, it. Yeah, the yeah. the adrenaline is different from situation to situation. What I'm finding is that with a trigger, it's much for, more forgiving with me in those high adrenaline situations yeah. than a hinge is. Because you're like, pin, send it. Yeah, it's, I it's just, just quick, easy. get on there. There's I can hold and I have good right. back tension. Right. And I like the feel. I put the pin on there and I just... It's in the same ones with the trigger too. Yeah. I could just... But then just pull, and there was never – it just shot well. So Aaron was kind of like, you're an idiot. Why are you shooting with a hinge? Because you don't have a problem with a, right, with right. a, with a trigger. And I'm Yet. like, because <laughs> that's that's one thing is yeah. people a lot of times if they overshoot. Right. That's why Aaron shoots with a hinge all year and then shoots it with a trigger during the, yep. during the hunts. Yep. And you see a lot among guys. Well, and I, guys. yeah, the releases I shoot, I shoot a, a true ball thing and a true ball HT. And one's a thumb button and one's a, uh, a hinge, but – Luckily for me, I anchor with the I anchor the same spot. I can go out eighty yards, shoot either release, and have, and so that's been a huge benefit for me to be able to swap back and forth yeah. and, and do exactly that. Like I'll shoot that hinge a lot, and I don't feel like like kind of what Cody's talking about. I I don't have to practice as much with my hinge to make those good shots. When I go to my trigger, I feel like I have to practice twice as much, as many arrows really? down range. Yeah. And to make that good shot under pressure, right? And that's the biggest, that's a big difference of, you know, a lot of guys come in here that to our shop and go, oh man, I've, I've been shooting great. I'm hitting these orange stickers. I'm shooting great. But you add pressure to that guy. They he doesn't make the it. same they shot. Lose it. <laughs> and that's where, you know, under pressure is where I want to just, I, I do the same thing. Like I want to control that shot so hard. Hmm. But the hinge for me, like there's something that happens with my brain when I'm at full drop again with my buck fever. I go, okay. I don't have to hammer this. I can. I'm going to execute the helps same. Helps you way. relax. It helps me it, relax. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page as far as the yeah. open relaxing. Huh. But, yeah. so it's yeah. what, it's whatever know, works for you. That, yeah. Like Matt, it, yesterday, yeah. I went out here behind the office. Yeah, right. Eighty yards, and I grabbed the thumb, and I'm like, I'm just going to punch all these. Just punch them <laughs> and see where it goes. Right. Yeah. They're all in the center right. insert. Like boom. Right. right. You just pull, hold, boom. Right. There's, yep. it's just like every time that's where you get in you're, trouble. You're that's gonna get you're the getting, snowball. You're, you're, we call it the snowball yep, effect. You're gonna yep. get in trouble because yep. you're gonna be like, "Ooh, I can have that candy all the time." Yeah. No, no, and but like, so that's just it. Is I did that, and I'm like, I like this, and then I shot the rest of the night with the hinge. Right, right. I just I, your when, brain cataloged that now. <laughs> and so next time, next time you go out, as soon as that pin gets close, it's like, "Ooh, it's gonna." That's what happens. That that's exactly how it happens. The snowball effect. You sit there, the pins there, you hammer, it, and your brain goes. I can do this all the time, but then that whole fight or flight thing kicks in and that, that if your brain wanted to be efficient, as soon as that pin even gets close before you can kind of settle in, you know, get it in the middle. As soon as that pin even gets close, your brain's like, Oh, I know what we're doing. And it wants I to have hit the trigger. Never done that. Really? Ever. You're lucky. I've yeah. never done that. You're like, the minority. But, yeah. <laughs> Cause yep. it happens. Like A my lot. whole, like all the years that I've, I've, I, my aunt, buddy Anthony struggled with this big time. And we, he talked about it. He had tr trigger panic for years and finally he's just like ready to throw his bow away. Right. And then he went and got a recurve and he shot that instead. Right. And that helped him get over that trigger panic. And then he goes out and he shoots, but he's like, dude, if I shoot for very long, I'm, I'm, I'm like, if he shoots every day, he shoots like maybe once a week and he was kind of okay but it, that trigger panic would come back really? just oh, yeah. from it's it's bad. And so then now he's got a hinge and he's been working through the hinge the last few last little while. And uh but no, I've never experienced that like uh Matt, like involuntary the pins there like kind of thing. It's right. never been a uh Yeah, you're lucky. We should be able to bottle that up somehow and sell it cuz yeah. I think for you you do a lot of mental training as well which is, is huge for that because it's all mental. If you just can tell yourself or self-talk yourself through it, um, there's stuff that you read on how to fix target panic and the blank bells and this and that. But a lot of it is literally telling yourself out, lay, out loud so you can change your conscious mind to where when you're when you're on an animal, mm -hmm. right, you tell yourself probably in your head, okay, pull, 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 pull. Yeah. That alone makes a big difference. Some people when they're doing that and they're aiming, they don't 
think anything and that's when they get in troubles because then your natural your your brain starts to take over it's like oh yeah again i know what i'm doing as soon as that pin's close we we, we shoot it right yeah i think so I, I don't know when i started talking to myself during the shot i know joel turner mm -hmm. uh, with yeah, he's big on iron that. mind yep. he he talked i know i really started to focus on it after a, f a few years ago after i started hanging out with joel and talking to him about it but i always had that thing where it was like pick a spot pick the spot pick right. a spot pick that spot and then once i'm like that's the spot i'm like squeeze 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 and that's just the the cue that i have and i do tell myself that because i've i have witnessed i have experienced like in that moment just blank thoughts right right and it's like you need to put your or worse than blank thoughts are there's people watching the camera's rolling mm -hmm. um uh you know there's there's uh, this has got to happen like you, when you step out right. in that third person and you're right. now now you're out of the moment if you can stay in the process right. i've found that block everything else you just out just block everything yeah. out you're in process That's it's like when you do public speaking mm -hmm. when you focus on the actual the thing that you're saying and how important it is to you or what, what the, what the point of it is. And instead of thinking about, do I look stupid? Did right. I just, is everyone yeah. laughing yeah. Or, or is anyone listening? No one's hearing me. Like you start stepping out and you start thinking about yourself, yourself and kind of third person, right. like the, the, you're screwed. Right. And so I've, that's where I, I'm like, pick that spot, pick it, pick it, find that spot. That's a perfect spot. And then it's like, squeeze, 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 squeeze. And I'm thinking about that moment. And I'm thinking also, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going <laughs> to yeah. die. You're so yeah. dead. You're going to die. Right. It, underlying all of that, because right. I found like, when you're thinking that you're so you're aggressive and you're in the moment. And I always, I usually make great shots when that happens. Like, you know, on this bear, I'm like, the bear's dead. The bear's dead. That's very... When I'm hunting the tar, I'm like, the hinge won't go. The hinge won't go. Yeah. Come on, hinge. Now, hinge. Yeah. Not in, and right. you're, and then completely wet the bed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like a, I kind of compare it like literally a switch going off in your head. Like, it's weird how I can go back and shoot and then, and certain animals, I'm like, oh, I'm so calm. And then you get a big buck that comes out and I'm like, oh, I really want to kill this thing. It's so big. And then my heart starts going. And then all this stuff goes, and it's like, you you mentally do not make the same exact shot and, and no it's so interesting and i you know i tell my customers all the time because like at the shop we've built these really cool steel targets that are cut out of nick like a big mule deer and a big elk and and uh you know we'll get guys go back in the range and they'll shoot these little tiny orange stickers and they're like man i'm shooting so good and they'll come out and brag oh man i yeah. put all three yeah. arrows in this orange sticker and then we pull that. I go, okay, really? I says, I'll, I'll put a wild arrow hat on the line for you. I says, you go back and shoot one arrow at this. If you make it, I'll give you a wild arrow hat. So we pull the, you know, the, the deer target out. And it's a, it's a much bigger circle. And he shoots and hits it into there. And it's like it breaks his arrow in the steel. And you're going, well, you under pressure do not make the same shot as you did in a good controlled environment. And so when it comes to like archery, and, and it's taken me years to kind of develop this with myself is, learning how to shoot that same shot under pressure. It's kind of like you talked about public right. speaking. Like it takes you, it takes time to mentally develop to be able to do that. And uh, so putting yourself in pressure situations and learning how to control it is huge. And, and uh, I, I always tell guys like at the shop when we're talking about this, I went to this indoor league shoot one year and there was, there was about 50 guys. There's a pretty big league shoot and we're shooting paper and I'm not much of a big paper shooter. You know, I haven't got much into it, but I get up there on the line and I felt like everybody was watching me. I'm like kidding. I'm like, man, and I'm aiming. I'll never forget this. I'm aiming at the top circle and I ginched my shot so bad. I hit an X <laughs> on the bottom left. Like it is that bad. And I just, I sat my bow down. I thought to myself, I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. come on. And, and through the course of that league and putting myself in that pressure in that situation, by the end of the league, I could get up on the line and have all 50 guys behind me just saying whatever they want, harassing me, whatever, and I could still make good shots. And by the time that league got over, I went, man, that was awesome. That league, that paper league made me, I know it's going to make me a better bow hunter because I put myself in that pressure situation and I learned to overcome it and block all that out and still make good quality shots. And I, I that's what sometimes any league you do, yes. like right. 3D or even the Total Archery Challenge, you know, yeah. Jordan will show up, he'll have like, seven or eight other high yeah. like 
profile hunters. They're all running, uh, uh, you know, an Instagram live, and now yeah. you're shooting your bow in front of all yep. these people at tack. And the last thing you want to do is, you know, you know, send one into the rock, into yeah. the rocks, yeah. you know, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and that absolutely builds a certain amount of of nervousness, and that's different, by the way, yeah. than I'll, I'll have people that try to simulate an elevated heart rate by you know, you, you, you run, you know, 400 meters, run back and drop and do like, you know, 10 burpees and then grab your bow and your shoot while right. you're like, while you're elevated, right. while your right. heart rate's high. Well, an elevated heart rate is much different than nervousness. hundred percent. They're, I'm they're, agreed. they're not the same because I can have a super elevated heart rate right. and be like gasping for air. And so my chest is heaving, come to full draw. But my hand and my body is so relaxed. Solid, yeah. It's totally different yep. than adrenaline. Yep. And so I'm like trying to control that breathing and that's fine. And, and it's good to practice, I think, and to shoot through sure. that, you know, but it's, it's, it's not the same thing as adrenaline. Right. So finding a situation where you can get your adrenaline spiked yep. and then overcome that it. And like you said, you, you did it through exposure. Right. over and over and over again at this league. And that I think is excellent. That gets you that step closer, just like, you know, burpees and shooting on with elevated heart rate. Like those things help you get a little bit closer. But even if you're like this guy that kills everything on paper, cause you've done it so many times, it's like, as soon as you step out of that realm and you have a giant six by six bull elk walk in, it's a whole new level of stakes and, mm-hmm. and at play. And it's almost like the only thing that's going to help you is succeeding at that a few times. Right. Right. You got to go out and we tell everybody, if you, if you want to really be a really good archer, go take as many hunting opportunities as you can. Right. Yeah. If there's, if there's doe tags or if there's cow tags, or if there's something that you can do to go out and shoot at an actual animal, because they're like, Oh, I, I, I'm a great shooter. I can shoot all day. I can shoot with the best of them. Actually firing an arrow at a live animal is completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shooting at paper, and, and I'm to the point where I feel like, <clears throat> like with bears, I've shot a lot of bears, I've hunted a lot of bears, and I walk out on a bear, and I have this feeling like, like it's just, it's just, it's just all adrenaline, but confidence adrenaline, right? You know what right. I mean? You're like like not do this, not we'll call it <laughs> doubt adrenaline. Yeah. It's there's no doubt adrenaline at all. It's just all right. confidence adrenaline. But then there's like other times where you're hunting in species or you're hunting in a spot with a completely foreign and brand new. And now you're like, you've got like fear adrenaline. Yeah. Like stakes are higher. Can I pull this off? And it's a totally different. And it's like with the one, it's, it's when you got the confidence adrenaline, you're you're riding high on it. And you, it seems like it's just that you perform better. Right. Right. But then that fear adrenaline is, is, is like you start blacking out. You, you're not going through your process. You're just drawing your bow and, you know, it's a whole different thing. And what I'm finding though is, man, <clears throat> it's hard to pull off a hand shot on, yeah. on that. On and, the fear adrenaline. And I'm finding like I hold well, I pick that spot and I squeeze and I can execute the shot a lot faster. One thing I thought about doing with the hand is making it a lot hotter than it is right now. Yeah. So that, you know, when I get through to that spot, I don't have to manipulate the hinge as, as much, much as I do right. right now to make it break. And that would help tremendously. I think maybe when I'm, you know, that nervous, but yeah. we, we mess around with it, but you need like the tiniest wrench on the planet yeah, to just yeah. John's. We, we sell those at the shop. Smooth. They're really expensive, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's very interesting to me for, you know, for all the years I've done this and talking to just so many customers of how there's like, I'm the type of bow hunter that, I have to shoot a ton and be super confident with my boat because when I get in that exact situation you're talking about, it has to be just automatic. Like I have to execute that shot and not think about it. But we have customers that come in all the time. They're like, oh yeah, this, you know, bull walked out. I drew back and shot him and killed him. And they, I'm like, how does your brain do that? Because if that same situation happened to me, I'd be like, okay, you know, I have to think through that shot. And so it's very interesting to me. I just like how just people are just wired a little bit different with that. And some people, you know, and like you just talked about the stakes, like, well, you know, I go on this hunt in New Zealand and my release won't go off and now you lose confidence in it. You probably don't want to use the next hunt, but you probably take that same release and go kill another bear. You're like, oh yeah, I've, I've done this. It's no big deal. And so you kind of get those building blocks and start moving them up. But 
it's like with me with big bucks, man. Like I cannot tell you how many big bucks I've missed. <laughs> Back when I was first bow hunting, and you know, I thought I was a good little archer until I got out there and started hunting deer, and, and I'm like, why is my heart trying to come out of my chest right yeah. now? And it's, it's frustrating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can't pull your bow back because yeah. you're so amped up. I've <laughs> yeah. never had that happen before, but I've had nightmares of that <laughs> happening. Like, yeah. What if yeah. I can't pull my bow back because my adrenaline's crazy? The and- thing is, too, is I've made some, I've made some tough shots and been like. Man, you're good. Yeah. Did you did you see what you just did? Like, <laughs> right. dang. Yeah. And then I've gone out and I've like completely just missed. Yeah. Just duffed it. And it and, and by a mile. Right. And you're like, uh, I think I saw one of those on a recent episode. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see the frustration yeah. in him, and I was like, I kind of just want to go give him a hug right now, yeah. even though yeah. that was yeah priorly filmed. It was a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Like. And it's funny too, when you put yourself out there and you're, and you just try to be as real as possible and open, it's like, <clears throat> people will criticize you. Like, they'll be like, dude, missed. I, I, he's not that good an archer. Right. It's like, I've also killed a lot. I mean, it, it goes both ways. Oh, and yeah. Anybody who has hunted with archery long enough, it's going to happen. They have their, their roller coaster. You're, you, you're even gonna some of the best guys in the industry that we know, that we talk to, they miss. I mean, it's just that, flat out. It happens. I've hunted so, with them, yeah, and I've watched them miss, yeah. Yeah. multiple times. Yep. Yep. And it's like you, you, you're out there, and that's the thing that I've realized is they all miss, and mm-hmm. they all miss multiple times. They just don't tell you about it, right? They just don't talk about it, right? And from my perspective, it's like, yeah, you could be, you could be made fun of because you miss. It's like, you know what? I think more people appreciate the fact that you admit that you, you miss, right? Uh, then then there are those that hate on you because you miss. Right. Yep. You're human. You know? Yeah. It's, it uh, you know, and see, even some of the best archers, some of the best bow hunters, man, like when you're out there in the field hunting, there is just so many little variables. Like the animal takes one step that, you know, you're at full jaw release, the animal takes one step. You're like, great. Like I did everything that I could control on my end, but the end result still wasn't what I wanted. And so, you know, that's what me and Cody talk about at the shop all the time. It's like, you know, when you're out there hunting, there's so many variables. What we are trying to do is control as many of those on the front end for customers and go, okay, like, is your bow, is your bow tuned properly? Is your arrow and broadhead combination where it needs to be? Is your draw link set right? Like, we're going to try to control as many of those variables on the front end as that we can mm-hmm. so that hopefully the end result is what you want to be. And that's not always the case. You could put in, you could shoot your bow every day and put in the time and hike the mountains, get in good shape and it still might not come together exactly how you want, you know, but that's bow hunting, man. That's something you got to, something you got to kind of, you know, learn to live with. And every year yeah. you just try to get a little bit better and a little bit better. So, yep. yeah, I agree. All right. Well, um, we could keep going on and I want you guys back on because, yeah. uh, your wealth of information, you guys live, you know, you guys are, your shop is right down the road. Right. And the studio is right here. Very <laughs> so, close. So convenient. Right? So, yeah. uh, I want to do that. I want to get you guys back, uh, more, more regularly. And so for those people that are listening, um, send in questions yeah. uh, and topics and ideas, anything you want answered. And, uh, and then I think what would be beneficial is if we do some, some live, a couple of live, uh, deals where, we can just get online, maybe Instagram or YouTube Live, something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. Facebook even, and, and just take questions from people mm-hmm. and uh, work through works through some things like that. Because you never know, you know, what might come out of that, and then then we could build some more topics off of that. But. Yeah. All right, guys. Where can they find you guys? Where's Wild Arrow at? Centerville, Utah. So we have a website. You can hit us up there. We've got uh, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, hit us up if you have any questions. Those guys can, uh, you know, we we respond back pretty quick. So they can just email at Wild Arrow. Email, uh, Facebook Messenger works good. We're usually pretty quick. We get so busy at the shop throughout the day that, you know, guys try to call from around, you know, we get calls from all over the country. And Mm -hmm. we're just so busy in the middle of the day that it's really hard for us to respond or have that long conversation. But, uh, you know, you know, email, Facebook, that kind of stuff. We can usually answer a lot of those after hours and, and, uh, you know, get guys helped out and get them put in the right direction. All right. You do Instagram at all? Yeah. Yep. While they're archery, Instagram. So I try to run some of that. We, but we try to. Yeah. We're too, too busy at the We're shop. We're not as good as you. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you guys have personal accounts where you like answer DMs? 
I, my, <laughs> I my, haven't my, gone down that road yet. Cause well, I do it on Wild Arrow's uh, account, but yeah. like my personal account. Now, I think I've done like five posts my whole life. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. uh, <laughs> my, my, my personal account. I, I don't just because, man, I. Oh, there's so many. There's so much. It's so hard to keep up with yeah. everything. And, oh, for sure. And, and keep up on everything. I, I don't think – so I struggle with two. One thing – I don't think I'd have an Instagram uh, if I didn't – if I hadn't started Gritty Bowman. But And I struggle with the idea of, of not having one because I feel like we all have a chance to represent hunting in a positive light. And the more of us that, that right. have a, an influence or right. build a platform, the more we can communicate that with – with uh the broader public so i feel like i have this this thing where i want to be private and i don't want to share my life or anything and then where i feel like a duty to to share it because uh it's like important that you do it you know it's right, like this, right. this thing or you where i struggle with it yeah we'll we'll help you with your bill you can you can you can spice <laughs> yeah. up our instagram yeah we need some help with that for sure <laughs> deal all right folks thanks for tuning in to the gritty podcast and as always stay gritty Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky, and on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place and time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>